Thank you very much, Or, for the introduction, and thank you for this opportunity uh, to speak to all of you. Um, welcome. Um, so I'll be telling you uh, a journey, uh, our journey that lasted a little over a, a decade in translating advanced magnetic resonance spectroscopy methodology to the clinical trial uh, setting with particular focus on neurodegeneration. All right, first, a very quick background on uh, MRS for um, those who may not be familiar um, with the technique on a day-to-day -day basis. Everything I will be telling you about um, will be uh, on single voxel MR spectroscopy where you select a region of in interest, collect a um, spectrum, and in this spectrum, each of these peaks are representative um, of a specific neurochemical that's concentrated enough to give the MR signal. So they need to be on the millimolar level or higher, and they each have a spectral um, signature. So, um, uh, and their intensities, the intensities of these peaks are proportional to um, the concentration in the tissue that's selected. So with this method, we can quantify endogenous neurochemicals, concentrated neurochemicals, um, and um, evaluate their changes in various diseases. We have at the high field, high and ultra high fields, we have access to a, a list of neurochemicals that looks like this, up to 20 neurochemicals, depending on the volume of interest, the size of the VOI, um, as well as the field strength. Um, and at lower field, you may know that we um, uh, this list ends right around here. Um, Na creatine choline, perhaps myonosto and lactate um, can be reliably quantified. But by going to uh, high fields, we have access to neurotransmitters like um, glutamate, um, GABA, antioxidants like glutathione, uh, vitamin C, etc. So the list increases with the increased sensitivity and resolution. And um, just going over a list of cellular and biochemical pro processes that are accessible by such a neurochemical profile quantification. First of all, changes in cell number and viability can be quantified. We have um, neuronal uh, biomarkers. n aspartate is by far the most widely validated um, neurochemical uh, as being uh, a neuronal marker and uh, glutamate is primarily localized uh, in neurons and the two tend to go down together in neurodegeneration. Then we have some potential uh, gliosis markers that include myonostol and glutamine. We have potential markers of demyelination and increased membrane turnover that include uh, choline containing compounds and in some uh, brain disease diseases, uh, mobile lipids become visible. Potential markers of defects in energy metabolism, like creatine, phosphocreatine, lactate, glucose, and finally, potential markers of oxidative stress that include glutathione and vitamin C. Next, I'm going to um, show you a quick video. So the disease entity that um, we've been focusing on uh, has been spinocerebellar ataxia, and this is a rare movement disorder. Ataxia means, the word ataxia means lack of coordination. And I thought um, a patient can tell about the disease a lot better than I can. So I have a short, uh, like two minute video that I'd like to show you, and then uh, I'll start um, with our um, research presentation. I don't know how to describe the sensation of what it feels like to have ataxia other than it's a little more time consuming. Everything is a little bit slower and harder to do. The balance portion of it, I don't realize I'm off because I don't sense what my body is doing until I'm starting to fall over. And then I realize there's a problem, but it's too late. The back of our brain, which is called the cerebellum, that part of the brain is slowly degenerating or going away. So it starts with difficulty with balance and gait and then progresses to anything that has voluntary muscle control. So difficulty with speech, breathing, anything that you have to physically do yourself. 
I found out that I had ataxia through genetic testing. They told me at that time I'd probably be in a wheelchair by the time I was 40. You know, at 21, that's hard to take. Not all ataxia is genetic, but mine happens to be genetic. I watched my father have a disease. So I grew up watching him have trouble walking and become in a wheelchair. I actually became a physician because of the experience I had with my dad. Knowing something is gonna to happen to you in the future makes you focus on today and really appreciate what's happening, your friendships, every opportunity you have to live life in the fullest because you realize that there is almost an expiration date. I picked my job because I felt like I could do that in a wheelchair. Although I love so many things in medicine, I love pediatrics, I love doing surgery. Those are career paths that weren't going to work for me. I love being a radiologist. It's a wonderful field. It's very technology oriented, so it's constantly changing and moving forward. And I love the people I work with. Yeah, uh, so she had to um, really make long-term um, life plans, even when choosing her spe specialty radiology, um, the disease was a very important consideration. So as Linda described, um, uh, most ataxias are neurodegenerative. Not all of them are hereditary. Um, some of them are sporadic, but we have been focusing primarily on hereditary ataxias. And amongst the hereditary ataxias, we've been focusing on spinocerebellar ataxias that are uh, dominantly inherited. So um, if one of your parents has it, you have 50-50 chance of inheriting it. And there are by now more than 40 different genetic forms. Uh, the four I'm listing here, SCA1, 2, 3, and 6, are the most common ones. And these uh, are all polyglutamine diseases. Um, that are uh, due to a CAG repeat expansion in the gene that codes for uh, glutamine. There are nine polyglutamine diseases, and uh, Huntington's disease happens to be the most well-known one. Uh, six of them are ataxias, but that, they are not as well-known. The first um, one, first mutation uh, that causes SCA was discovered by my uh, dear uh, collaborator, Dr. Harry Oren, who dissolved me. This is a picture of them at the time uh, of the discovery. And we've been focusing a lot on SCA1, one of the more common forms. Uh, as of now, there are no disease modifying treatments. And um, this is uh, how our uh, journey started more than a decade ago. This actually uh, started out with a very simple question um, that a, um, a clinician, my uh, dear collaborator, Dr. Chris Gomez, um, contacted me with, and this is an actual copy from his email at the time, I'm wondering if you have an interest in addressing the following question. Do changes in the metabolic activity decrease or increase in the brain areas most and earliest affected in hereditary ataxia precede signs of atrophy and motor impairment? And that's how it all started. And I um, learned, first of all, about the diseases and the effects of the cerebellum. We had never focused on the cerebellum, which has uh, a lot of challenges in terms of MR technology. But um, we decided to, to pursue um, this question together. So um, we first started out with some pilot investigations, um, small cohort of patients. In this case, I'm showing data from one patient with SCA1 versus um, one control, the spectra are from individuals. And even um, someone who is not familiar um, with spectroscopy or uh, look, looking at uh, spectra can see that there's a clear decrease in NAA, clear increase in uh, creatine, myonostol. So this is the neuronal marker that I mentioned. Myonostol is the putative glial marker. So on an individual case basis, you can see these um, uh, changes in spectra. Then when you combine the data, even over um, 10 people, uh, you see highly significant differences. Um, one thing we have uh, been doing is looking at um, Plots like this that uh, plot some of the uh, markers, for example, the neuronal marker, N-acetyl aspartate versus the glial marker, myonostol. 
when we observe that the groups, uh, the neurochemical levels between the groups um, are so different, there is no overlap um, between the groups. And then, of course, the next um, question is, um, well, do these neurochemical abnormalities reflect the clinical status in the disease? Are they relevant to, to the clinical presentation? And the answer was yes. So these are some data from the cerebellum showing um, associations with NAA minostol and glutamate, um, two neuronal one glial markers with the most widely used and validated ataxia score. This is uh, the scale for the assessment and rating of ataxia on the y-axis here. And we saw strong um, correlations with these um, markers um, of neurodegeneration. Then in parallel, we have done some animal marker work, primarily with Dr. Harry Orr, who had discovered uh, the first SCA gene. And uh, he started out with an SCA1 mouse model. And here I'm showing data, both uh, histology and MRS. The MRS data are uh, all from one individual mouse. And then the histology data are, of course, uh, from different mice. So we started out the study with a larger uh, cohort of mice. And it, at each of these time points, we um, uh, sacrifice some of them to correlate the histology with the MRS me measures. And you can see in the wild type animal that the concentrations are pretty stable. I'm particularly showing you the NA glutamate myonostol where we um, saw the potential uh, for biomarkers in patients. Whereas in a mouse, uh, in an SCA1 mouse, you see even on the single uh, mouse basis, the decrease of NA over time and glutamate decreases over time and myonostol increases over time. So they do reflect the underlying pathology in the cerebellum. And you can see the cerebellar atrophy in, in this mouse starting out at six weeks, there is the, the cerebellum is normal size and slow, slowly it shrinks. We did make our volume of interest for spectroscopy smaller to cover the same um, region over time. And then we looked at uh, associations of the N uh, MRS markers with quantitative measures of the pathology. And molecular layer thickness is a well-accepted marker of um, progressive pathology in these mice. And again, uh, with the same neurochemicals that showed biomarker potential in uh, patients, we saw good correlations, um, good associations with uh, the pathological markers here I'm showing the molecular thickness, NAA minus glutamate being the markers. Then in a different um, model, we investigated um, the question of potential neurochemical changes before even gross, gross pathology um, is observable in these mice. And this is a different line with a different uh, repeat length. Um, and here I'm showing the molecular layer thickness in wild type versus the SCA1 mice throughout the study. This is close to one year, not exactly one year, up to uh, nine months we uh, investigated these mice because after that, that, that they start uh, dying. Um, the molecular layer thickness is really not affected, unlike the previous model. The uh, severity score um, it's a co combined composite pathological severity score was only different at the latest time point. On the other hand, when we looked at um, MRS biomarkers, some of them were different already starting at six weeks. Here I'm showing those. Notice they are not the same markers that were marking the degenerative process. These are early biochemical markers that start to be abnormal. Prior, uh, to, uh, prior to the degenerative changes in the brain, taurine, total choline, gluta uh, glutamine, and uh, total creatine. So in this talk, I'm going to be going back and forth between MRS technology and clinical preclinical applications, because that's how this work really um, came about. So everything I've shown you in human subjects so far was acquired with a uh, 
to the STEAM sequence. Um, those of you familiar with um, spectroscopy may know it loses half of the available signal. Uh, the reason why we had started using STEAM was that we had at the CMRI, we had a really well optimized sequence that was working very reproducibly. So that was our go to gold standard sequence. But then after some, some point, it was becoming not acceptable to lose half the available signal. So we developed a new um, pulse MRS pulse sequence. Uh, it's a modified semilaser. Semilaser idea has been out there uh, previously, but this is a single shot method uh, that utilizes um, uh, adiabatic full passage uh, pulses to select two of the three dimensions. It's semi because one of the um, uh, dimensions is still selected by a conventional uh, 90 degree pulse. So we combined it with uh, highly optimized water suppression and outer volume suppression uh, techniques and we started test and validate the sequence. And the sequence was optimized to minimize uh, the chances for unwanted coherences with um, various features like the uh, asymmetric gradient scheme. So this um, figure shows um, the quality of single shots that you can acquire um, with the sequence. Here's a one, one shot, two shots, etc can see that there are no unwanted coherences even in a single shot. And then we compared it and validated, including the quantification against our um, gold standard STEAM, and it stood up uh, out quite well. And you see the um, SNR increase of uh, four data acquired from the same region of interest. And this figure over here shows that even though the echo time with semi-laser is substantially longer than STEAM, you still have a very similar um, spectral uh, appearance because of the way the sequence worked, the apparent um, PE is actually um, much shorter. It looks, the spectral look more like an ultra short echo STEAM. Then we transferred uh, this sequence that was originally developed on the Varian Agilin platform to the Siemens platform for uh, more applicability to clinical cohorts. And these are data um, uh, acquired with that um, Siemens sequence um, on, yeah, on the, um, I, I'm sorry, this is showing uh, STEAM, but we started out translating our Varying sequences to Siemens with STEAM, and then we incorporated semi-laser in the same pipeline. So why go to great lengths to utilize these advanced packages as opposed to the press and STEAM that comes on the scanner, prepackaged and the, the, the commercial um, versions? I have a comparison here of data for the regions of interest, this is cerebellar vermis acquired at three Tesla um, that were acquired using the in-house uh, protocol, including the shimming, the zero shimming method, versus an example that I just pulled from literature for um, the, essentially the same region of interest acquired with press. This is an example for the ponds. You can see the differences in um, SNR, in uh, spectral line width, et cetera. I mean, there um, are of course literature examples that are even worse <laughs> at seven Tesla. So that's not, perhaps not too meaningful, but it shows you that your um, spectral quality can uh, substantially improve with this kind of in-house sequence. Then we evaluated the reproducibility of data acquired with the sequence, both at three Tesla and seven Tesla. And we did a small healthy volunteer study. And here I'm showing data acquired from one single individual that was scanned four times on each scanner. And those spectra are overlaid here. So this panel shows four um, spectra acquired from the same individual um, on consecutive weeks. And you can see um, visu visually, it is apparent how reproducible the data can be, both at three Tesla 
and its seventh test. And with this kind of um, reproducible acquisition, um, we are able to um, quantify the main um, um, most interesting metabolites, uh, the highest concentration metabolites, any um, creatine, uh, choline, minostol, glutamate, including glutamate, with test three test uh, coefficients of variance that are within 5% for these two regions of interest we looked at in that study, both at three Tesla and seven Tesla. So this is the quantification also is uh, highly reproducible. Then um, um, for any kind of um, translation of advanced MR technology, I think dissemination is a very important component. We've been sharing this package through C2P to other um, semen sites around the world. This is just a um, snapshot from our CMRR website. My colleagues, uh, Gosha Marianska and Evi Auerbach or, are also sharing different MRS sequences. This is the one um, that I've been talking about, the bottom one here. And of course, uh, uh, spectroscopy doesn't end with acquisition. You need to have good tools for analysis. And my colleague, Dr. Bielchand, has been sharing his uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy analysis tool, this MR SPA, freely with anyone um, who is interested through the same website. Then we started to get into uh, between site re reproducibility evaluations. And here are some of our first data once uh, when we first started sharing the sequence with other sites. And MGH, of course, was one of the uh, sites. And these are data acquired by my dear colleague, Dr. Eva Ratai. I think she's online. And then other collaborators, Dr. Fanny Moschel's group in Paris acquired. Uh, acquired these data and this, these are data acquired uh, in Minnesota. So these are healthy volunteers, different volunteers, obviously, at the different sites. Um, operators are different. The sequence, calibration methods, everything is identical. So, and you can see the spectral quality uh, is really um, reproducible. If the waters, there were no differences in water suppression, which you can see over here, it would be hard to tell um, the differences from spectrum to spectrum. And this is all acquired with the standard Siemens 3 Tesla hardware using a 32 channel receiver array. Then with, um, uh, with the Paris site, we actually did um, a two site reproducibility study in uh, healthy control participants, uh, 20 to 30 subjects at each site, again, focusing on these two regions of interest that are very relevant to ataxia, cerebellar vermis, and pons. And essentially, we showed that uh, as long as the data are acquired with the same uh, quality, uh, quality assurance um, procedures, the same calibrations, the concentrations can, in fact, be pooled across sites. There was no difference um, between uh, the concentrations acquired at the two sites for the healthy brain. Then we started to get into between vendor um, comparisons. And our uh, collaborators in uh, Netherlands, Bart van der Ven and Dennis Klomp and Tom Skane, and they implemented the identical sequence. We shared all the timing, the pulses that are utilized, et cetera, with them. And they implemented it um, on Philips platform. And we did a study um, where we covered the two um, common vendors, Siemens and Philips, and seven healthy volunteers were scanned at four different sites at CMRR and three European sites. And everybody was scanned and rescanned on all systems. And these are data collected from one of those participants uh, at uh, both scans at um, all four sites. So we have um, CMRR and Essen as the Siemens site here, um, and Utrecht and Leiden uh, are the Philips sites. In, in different colors are the different uh, spectra, um, scan and rescan spectra that are acquired at all those sites. We just chose a general gray matter and a general white matter region. And again, you can see that the spectral quality can be quite um, reproducible. 
And these are correlations of um, concentrations obtained at scan one versus scan two um, for the most um, uh, um, reliably quantified metabolites, any creatine, choline, minus, or glutamate, and glutamine. And you see uh, the nice correlations from scan to rescan. This is combining all data from all subjects. So meanwhile, while we were doing this, um, uh, uh, pursuing the harmonization effort and optimizing technology, viable uh, treatment options started to come into the pipeline for SCAs, for these um, rare hereditary movement disorders. And they covered a span from interventions at the DNA level to RNA level down to protein, as well as targeting um, indicated pathways. Of um, these different options that the community was pursuing, uh, antisense oligonucleotide therapies um, have brought really great excitement um, to the field. So um, some of you may be familiar with the ASO therapies. These have been around um, for a long time for um, various peripheral conditions, but for brain diseases, the last, I would say maybe five plus years have really seen a lot of activity. So these are, um, um, short um, DNA sequences that are complementary to a target RNA sequence. And um, through various mechanisms that are summarized here, they um, reduce the translated um, amount of protein. So it's ideal for this kind of hereditary condition if you um, target the um, coding sequence for the uh, SCA1 causing um, protein, the attacks in one in this case, you have a good chance of stopping disease, the disease at the uh, very high level. So um, quite recently in 2016, uh, there was great excitement because um, it, um, the first ASO-based uh, treatment was FDA approved for um, a brain condition, spinal mus mu muscular atrophy. And in that work, um, investigators have shown that the best outcomes were actually in pre-symptomatic SMA before even the neurological um, symptoms are manifest. So you have, in a hereditary disease, you have that window of opportunity before uh, degenerative changes start because you have the genetic test, you can identify individuals and even administer uh, treatments before any symptoms start. So uh, that is great. It, that hasn't started yet, except for this um, one case in the trial setting, but that's where the field is going. And there have been first in human trials in ALS as well as Huntington's disease showing um, the tolerability, safety, and now in these areas, phase two, even phase three, one phase three uh, trial has been going on. So there's a lot of interest and SCAs are next in line for this type of treatment. So, um, and for these kinds of trials, of course, the first um, mo most commonly utilized outcome measure is the clinical, the va va validated clinical outcome measures. And I have mentioned the SARA, and that is really the, the outcome measure, the go-to outcome measure that everyone um, designing a clinical uh, trial utilizes. But here are the estimated number of patients for specifically SCA1 based on the natural history data for the SARA outcome measure per group, per arm, of a two-arm trial, treatment placebo, for 80% power. And th this is plotted against um, effect size. So even for a pretty large effect size, this is slow, slowing down of the clinical progression over a year uh, by 50%, you need in each arm of the trial about 100, uh, 100 people. And these, are, these uh, simulations are, um, based on some European data and some US data, multi-site uh, clinical trial readiness data. So this is tough, especially in um, 
uh, rare neurodegenerative diseases. So additional secondary outcome measures are needed like imaging to uh, bring down these sample sizes. So that of course brings us back uh, to the question, well, we've been showing the sensitivity of these MRS measures to the disease progression. They reflect underlying pathology, but are they sensitive to disease reversal? So then we of course went um, to some animal model work using conditional SCA1 mice developed in uh, Dr. Harry Orr's lab, where they put the expression of the mutant attacks in one gene under doxycycline control. So this is not a treatment that you would be able to apply to patients, but this is a, um, a simulated treatment. So you can essentially turn the um, abnormal gene on and off at will at the different times of uh, the progression of the disease in these mice. And they had shown that the, both the neurological phenotype and the pathology was reversible, mostly at early and mid stages of uh, degeneration, but uh, even to some extent at late stages. And this is um, a pathology slide that shows animals treated with doxycycline have thicker molecular layers as opposed to animals that are untreated. So these are pretty clear um, differences. When you turn the gene off, animals do better. So then um, using this model, we designed a study with MR spectroscopy where we treated um, uh, 14 mice from 12 weeks of age up to 24 weeks of age. We have an untreated group, and we also had a wild type group. And we have done spectroscopy at both points, as well as um, some other uh, standard measures, Rotorod being the standard uh, motor assessment in uh, mice histology and quantitative PCR. That shows, of course, how much uh, uh, the suppression of the transgene has worked with doxycycline. So that's the gold standard to evaluate the doxycycline. And um, here are um, uh, receiver operator characteristic, the rock curves that show sensitivity versus specificity. And most of you are probably familiar with these, but um, uh, you're looking at the area under the curve in, uh, in these plots and an area under the curve. Um, okay. Um, and th this is the curve here. Uh, area under the curve of one means perfect separation of the two groups that you are looking at in this case. Um, so no overlap in the data. And the quantitative PCR, of course, shows a very high area under the curve, distinguishing treated from untreated mice. Molecular layer thickness, that's the pathological measure, same, almost area under the curve of one. Similarly, a combined measure of our spectroscopy metrics showed an area under the curve of one. So MRS was in this study under these circumstances as sensitive as the invasive outcome measures, both molecular layer thickness and the quantitative PCR. They, those are invasive measures. We also did the Rotorot, the standard behavioral uh, motor assessment. And while it did distinguish uh, treated from untreated animals, it wasn't nearly as sensitive as the invasive methods or MRS. So. Um, so th these data overall showed that MRS is sensitive indeed to disease reversal. Um, and as we had shown also previously, we also showed uh, that the uh, MRS measures in this case, NA over minus, so this is like a neural glial um, ratio that has good associations with the molecular layer thickness. And not only that, also showed good associations with uh, relative transgene expression. So it was reflecting the degree of transgene um, expression that comes from um, the quantitative PCR data. Then we moved on more recently to actually test uh, one of these ASO um, therapies in a mouse model uh, with Dr. Harry Orr. Um, so, uh, investigating ASO-mediated reduction of attacks in one. And first, they showed effects on motor impairment. These are rotorot data latency to fall. So the mice 
are um, placed on a rotating rod and then you monitor the time it takes for them to fall. It shows um, indication of um, balance impairments, and ataxia in this case. And they showed that um, after injection of an ASO that's designed specifically um, for the mutation in these mice reverses um, um, the, the impaired performance of the SCA1 mice. And also they showed a great improvement in survival. We studied these mice with spectroscopy and in, in fact showed um, that ASO treatment reverses select neurochemical abnormalities. In this case, myonostol and choline were the responder uh, neurochemicals. So these are data showed from the cerebellum and treated mice, vehicle treated mice, as well as wild type mice. So you can see the um, treated mice come closer if you focus on myonostol here, for example, ASO treated mice are really um, no different than wild types under the circumstances, so complete reversal. Then going back to our patient work, um, of course we had to uh, investigate the sensitivity of these MRS markers to the progression of the disease, clinical progression of the disease. Everything we had done previously had been cross-sectional. And we did a study in SCA1. And here I'm showing data acquired from three regions of interest, from a control participant and a participant with SCA1. And again, like the earlier pilot data, you can see the differences uh, between subjects on an individual spectrum basis. In this study, we also did some volumetries we, because um, large multicenter studies had occurred uh, already, especially in Europe, using volumetric MRI and showing that MRI uh, volumetric measures were more sensitive to change than the SARA assessment in, in large cohorts. So we essentially added spectroscopy to that kind of design here. And uh, because of the involvement of cerebellum in brainstem primarily with the volumetry only in those areas. And consistent with the previous uh, MRI, volumetric MRI measures, we also saw MRI in fact was more sensitive to disease uh, progression than clinical scale, but we also saw the same for MR spectroscopy. So these are plots of uh, percent change per year for these specific measures, NA over minostol in different regions, um, cerebellar white matter, PONS, et cetera. And these are uh, the same measures, um, similar volumetric measures um, with the same uh, percent change uh, per year axis. So PONS really stood out. Pon PONS volumes were more sensitive to change and NA over minostol was more sensitive to change. This is showing controls that do not really show change during a three-year time frame. We scanned everyone three times over a three-year span, whereas SCA1 um, group shows deep decline, both um, in these metrics and the volumes. And when you calculate the effect sizes, which is the mean annual percent change divided by the standard deviation of percent change, um, volumetry, uh, came out most sensitive, followed by MRS, followed by the SARA score. Uh, we also did um, a seven Tesla study with um, the four most common SCAs. This was cross-sectional, but we also had uh, an interest uh, in pre-manifest abnormalities. A subset of our patients, a small subset, a handful of them, but nonetheless, some of them, were in the pre-manifest stage where ataxic sim symptoms uh, were not apparent yet. So, and these are some of the data shown from the, those pre-manifest individuals. I'm only showing SCA one and two. And even at that stage in single spectra, you can see neurochemical abnormalities before ataxia onset. And when we um, did a uh, distance weighted discrimination analysis, which is a machine learning algorithm that separates two or more groups um, uh, based on an uh, optimized hyperplane. 
um, by minimizing the inverse distance of each data point from the uh, hyperplane, we noticed that um, these, uh, some of these pre-manifest mutation areas were classified with the manifest patient. So in this case, we are looking at SCA1 versus controls. And the individual, the pre-manifest individuals are the ones that have the circle. So two out of those three were classified with the manifest individuals. So what was different between those uh, individuals that were on the SCA1 manifest side versus controls? We decided to estimate the the number of years to disease onset, which you can do in these uh, hereditary diseases based on the CAG repeat size and current age. And it turned out that th those cases who had an estimated um, uh, number of years to onset of less than 10, 10 or less, were the ones uh, that showed the neurochemical abnormality. So that is quite interesting and uh, indicates that MRS may detect pre-manifest alterations in SCA up to 10 years before onset of ataxia. Going back to some uh, technical work that we have done, again, in our own uh, hands and with comparison to literature, um, spectral quality um, reports, um, we could tell um, um, we, we were experiencing the advantages of um, the advanced spectroscopic methods versus the commercial methods, but it was time uh, at this point to systematically evaluate this. So we did a study with, a co with our uh, collaborator, Dr. Kantarji at Mayo Clinic, where we scanned in the same session, 30 healthy elderly individuals with the conventional Siemens provided um, commercial press package, including the shimming and all, all steps, all calibration steps. And in, the, in a randomized fashion, we, um, uh, we, we changed the order of these acquisitions. And in the same session, we also utilized our package. And here is a sample spectrum that was acquired with the conventional versus advanced MRS protocol. And here's an overlay of the 30 healthy elderly with the advanced protocol and the conventional protocol. And just by looking at the data, you can appreciate the reproducibility that's increased with the advanced protocol. And once we quantified these data, we also could um, demonstrate the advantages of advanced uh, method. So um, of course, I should go back to this, uh, doing this work while uh, MR technologists, clinical um, neuroradiology technologists acquired these data, uh, it was challenging because at this point, our protocol was running um, with manual um, B0, B1 calibrations. Um, the workflow was difficult and um, Dinesh had to travel to Mayo Clinic multiple times for each MR technologist when they first started the data acquisition for the training, reinforcement, and so So we learned that it was not sustainable. It ha this had to be um, simplified. The protocol had to be simplified. So we obtained a, a bioengineering research partnership grant, and MGH is a site of this with Dr. Yotai uh, as site PI, where we started out with um, technology automation and refinement. And then in the next two phases, evaluating multi-site, multi-vendor um, validity and reproducibility. In the uh, rare disease case, patients with hereditary ataxias, and then taking it to the generalizability phase um, with a more uh, common uh, neurodegenerative disease, MCI, AD, at different sites. So we have seven sites in this study. It's still ongoing. As the first uh, piece of automation and simplification of the protocol, we automated voxel placement because this is uh, an, an ongoing challenge for single voxel uh, MRS, the variability of voxel placement from uh, MR technologist to MR technologist, as well as longitudinal uh, placement. So we developed this uh, uh, auto VOI method where you um, define your volume of interest on an atlas. It can be MNI, it can be uh, an in-home, at, at home generated uh, uh, special atlas. And during the MR acquisition, MR session, 
the uh, patient images get registered to the atlas and the coordinates and location um, of the voxel gets transferred to the scanner um, and you pick from a drop down menu which volume of interest you want to scan and then uh, the automatic placement happens. So we demonstrated the improvements of that method over manual placement using existing data. These are actually data from um, the Mayo Clinic um, investigation where um, highly trained MR uh, neuroradiology technologists has, had placed the sim relatively simple posterior cingulate voxel. And with AutoVOI, we showed that you can um, improve the consistency of placement. And um, after this voxel placement automation, um, Dinesh automated the actual full protocol, including the calibrations, uh, including VOI-based B0, B1 calibration, and then uh, finally acquiring single-shot metabolite and water uh, spectrum uh, data. This is so far only available on the Siemens um, platform, and it is running at MGH. So. I have, a, again, a quick video uh, because I know uh, you guys use Siemens scanners, so I wanted to show um, how this protocol works. So you start out with the MPRH images, and then um, the images get sent to the auto VOI, and then coordinates received. So you select your volume of interest that you um, want to scan from a drop-down menu. Um, um, and while the calculation happens, you can run, for example, the T2. Then you go to the spectroscopy acquisition, and there uh, you select the region of interest that has been computed, and you essentially hit apply, and then uh, sit back and relax while it goes through the different calibrations. So first, um, there is a line width check and then this is fast map shimming that automatically runs. This is the end of fast map shimming um, showing the improved line width relative to the start. Then the uh, 90 degree calibration, the power calibration is run. So these are all queued. Um, the operator does not intervene. Then the water suppression calibration is done to minimize the water signal in the selected region of interest. And then the um, metabolite acquisition starts single shot and gets saved. Um, so this is the water reference acquisition and then metabolite single shot acquisition in um, single shots get saved as well as the sum spectrum gets saved. Okay. In the meantime, the community underwent a lot of consensus efforts, and I just want to show you um, the abstract of this methodological consensus that officially recommended the semi-laser type um, sequence at three Tesla and above over the um, conventional press sequence. Of course, then we had to work on um, harmonization of the semi-laser sequence across all three major platforms. And this paper just came out last year, actually showing this is, um, phantom data, spectral quality, and pattern reproducibility across the three major platforms, and then spectral quality equivalence between these. And then um, we acquired data from five different regions of interest that we are interested in, and I'm showing um, just one region, the cerebellar region, uh, collected from, uh, in each case, from five subjects, mean spectra and standard deviation of spectra. So they are very comparable. And then we, of course, started to apply this harmonized method in clinical cohorts 
starting with SCA3, which is the most common SCA. And this was presented this, this year at ISMRM, showing some data from healthy controls um, and then quantification results from healthy controls and subjects with SCA3 that are very comparable across sites. So this is the last piece in the journey, um, a clinical trial readiness study, a U01 um, study that is currently ongoing. We are in the middle of it. We have about 20 clinical sites and six imaging sites that also includes MGH with all these wonderful um, clinical collaborators, site PIs. We also have two sites in Europe and um, we are targeting an MR cohort uh, of the uh, most common and most fast progressing SCA, SCA1 and SCA3, a substantial number of pre-manifest individuals. Um, and these are our sites. And um, our U01 supports baseline one year and two year acquisitions. And we have some industry support to add a three year follow-up and a six month um, scan. We are using three Tesla Siemens. We do morphometry, diffusion, and resting state fMRI using HCP lifespan uh, protocol, and we do MRS. So the lessons learned through this um, journey, uh, I always found that working on rare diseases has been very fulfilling. The um, patients, they treat you like kings and queens. They are so happy that um, their disease is investigated and they are very willing to participate. The, the process of translation has been very nonlinear as the uh, talk showed. Um, we learned that we very seriously need to consider skills and bandwidth of the end users of technology, working with the community, not only patient, but also clinical community is highly important and also fulfilling. And for multi-site study activation, um, the conclusion I came to has been, you need to plan for in-person study prep and training as opposed to online, but of course, COVID very much complicates that. So this is our ataxia team at CMRR. I'm very proud of the work um, they have been doing. My dear colleagues, Dr. Langlet and Virgil Henry, they lead another large effort in a different form of ataxia, free drugs ataxia, recessive early onset. Um, and yeah, I can't say enough good things about our um, larger team and our partners in crime uh, in this journey that lasted more than 10 years. I'd like to acknowledge our clinical collaborators, MR collaborators, uh, prior lab members and um, collaborators on the animal model work. Uh, Lynn is, has been our biostatistical um, co-investigator through all this and funding uh, sources. Thank you for your attention.